don't you, you you're not allowed to drive a charger and listen to bad music in your car the dri- drive a, a dodge charger and oh it, <laughs> i thought you were shitting on electric cars for a, for a second but uh, no no yeah <laughs> no, brother it's all it's all fucking it's all fucking oil and gas Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This is another episode of the Scoped Exposure podcast. We go from Calgary down to Los Angeles, and I'm very, very excited to be chatting with the man, the myth, the legend, Michael Barr from Volumes. Thanks for joining me on the show, buddy. What's up, man? How are you? Thanks for having me. I am doing well. Um, It is total opposite uh, temperatures-wise as far as the two different places that we're both uh, talking from, but... um, you know, it's it's very ironic. I'm going to be going down to L.A. for work um, just next week. So I'm excited that we're sitting here and doing this uh, to, to obviously chat about volumes. But I might have to pick your brain on some go to L.A. spots. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I got hit up uh, to chat with you. And, uh, you know, Volumes put out a, an album super, super recently that uh, I've been jamming. And um, I think for me, when I was like first getting into this heavy music space, like listening to uh, like No Sleep and, and uh, I don't know if it's Via or Via, whatever, however it's properly pronounced, but some of those earlier albums that are almost like 10 years, um, like some are actually 10 years old, were really influential to me. So getting to speak with you today is very sick uh, for, you know, uh, Spencer first getting into this space. But before we chat about music, we got to chat, check some bevs. So it's tradition for the guests to go first. So tell me what you're going to be sipping on the show. So I like freaked out and I was like 10 minutes ago, I was like, babe, can you make me a instant coffee drink? So my girlfriend like makes these like, these like it's half drunk now, but it looked more prettier. Um, <laughs> She, she makes these like instant coffee drinks that are fucking great with like $2 instant coffee, you know? Mm. So that's what I'm sipping on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's that's your, uh, what's that? I was just gonna say, like, I thought I wasn't going to be ready. So I needed to get an extra. <laughs> so I was screaming at her. From no, that's all good. I've, I've had people check, you know, just tap water in, in a giant mason jar. And I'm like, Hey, and any Bev works here on the show. Um, I'm going to be drinking something kind of similar. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how familiar with the show you are, Michael, but we actually have some beverage sponsors on the show. Oh, so nice. um, I'm going to be drinking uh, Say When, uh, a dirty chai concentrate mix. So That looks bomb. So based up here in uh, Delta, just outside, outside of Vancouver, Canada, um, it's kind of like a one-to-one mix. So... Uh, people always like, what is like dirty? What does that even mean? So, um, it's kind of got like the organic coffee, the spiced chai, and then the warm cocoa. And what's great is you can do it, uh, hot or cold. So I'm going to be drinking it cold over ice and I'm just going to make it with you while we're on the podcast to really show you the goods. Do you, are you, uh, you put anything else in it or that's it? No, no, no. So we got half, half the chai and then we got the oat milk. Yeah. And then bing, bang, boom. Boom. Yeah, dude. That looks We're all good. set to good. Yeah. Yeah. Are that, you a chai person yourself or dirty chai? Is that, both. do you fuck yeah. with that? I, that was like my first introduction to caffeine. And then after, you know, I had enough of that, I moved on. But total, like, yeah, anything chai really, I like. I'm intrigued by that. By that drink. I'll have to uh, hit them up and uh, get you set up with, dude, with some little I'll, care package. I'll, I'll guzzle it. <laughs> yeah. Well, all uh, all that being said, cheers to you, my friend. Cheers. Really excited to be doing this podcast. Yeah, with you. man, awesome. Thanks for having me, dude. Absolutely. You know, we got the hot coffee, we got the cold coffee. You know, <laughs> yours is half, mine's full. You know, it's a nice, it's a nice balance. I had ice this morning, so we're mm-hmm. about you know. What's what's it like? So let let's hit on this a little bit before we get in, into the chats. When you're in L.A., are you like always 
like iced because you know you guys are getting like super cold temperatures or do you need like a hot coffee in the morning um i sometimes i'll do hot if it's really early but typically iced only because the place i go to like the best thing they have there is iced like their hot coffee is good but the iced coffee is really good so i mm. when it's really cold out like i typically get an iced coffee too but yeah i switch it up i like to mm -hmm. i like like you know, it's really in the winter like a couple months ago i was doing a lot of hot coffee because it was really cold it's warming mm -hmm. up now so by 10 o'clock it's good to have some iced coffee in your hand right yeah like i feel like in the in the winter months up here in canada i'll do like uh an iced coffee as like a second drink you know at that 1 p.m 2 p.m kind of time yeah and so, you know, hot coffee in the morning, may, the option for an iced. But when it's like the the summer months here, I feel like I need to drink only iced to just really salvage, you know, the uh, the the very warm, warm environment that Canada only gets. Well, especially this part of Canada only gets yeah. like maybe for six months of the year. Yeah, the morning, the morning heat sucks. Like the sun, it's cool. It like, reminds me of being a kid, but uh yeah when it's like seven and it's hot already like we get a lot of that like for months like probably gonna start it in a couple of weeks actually so mm -hmm. that's yeah that's definitely iced coffee time <laughs> yeah. you're like can i do this iced coffee as a shower to like start my day like i don't know we've been having have to rig that up yeah we've been having crazy weather so my coffee game has been all over the place like it's it's like really warm for like two days or like 48 hours and then it rains and then it's like windy and then it goes back to being cold like it's all over the place right now yeah That's do you uh do you have like a max coffee intake like you're like if i have more than three i'm just gonna have the caffeine shakes all day i usually do two, i usually do no more than three a day two's pretty good for me mm. i'm pretty caffeine intensive like i drink a lot of caffeine but I'm pretty like one or two sips. I'm flying. Right. <laughs> so by the second cup, it's like, I'm like cracked out, um, which isn't good, but yeah, mm. I usually cap it at two. So I won't be able to sleep. Yeah, that's fair. I always like, um, I'll do like a, a hot chai tea, like at, you know, seven, eight, 9 PM. If I, if I'm like working and editing a podcast, you know, just to kind of like give me that extra push That's, into the, you yeah. know, the the midnight oil times. But um, yeah, like not slamming any kind of Americano at that, that kind of hour. They need to make an alcoholic beverage that's like has caffeine in it, like not like mm. but like a ubiquitous one. Like you can do like what is it, like amaretto and those like Italian after dessert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, but I feel like if there was one. At like 7 Eleven. That, <laughs> that was like a beer, but there's caffeine in it. That would be that would get me through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does it doesn't need to be like at a bougie kind of like um liquor store that you have to like go through like a, a vending machine to like to get to. It needs to be super accessible at like a 7 Eleven to for yeah. it to really hit. Yeah, dude. Like uh do they even have a drink like that? Like a alcoholic caffeinated drink? I don't think so. No, I th I think we have to workshop this idea and you Dude. know take it to you know. like I, like an Irish coffee is like the first thing that comes to my mind. That would be mm. gangster Irish coffee like drink at seven eleven. Mm. So, uh, yeah, good idea. it's always it's always funny hearing you say that because. And I had this, I only had this realization uh, a few months ago is that the 7-Elevens up here in Canada don't have, um, uh, you can't buy alcohol there. Right. So yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Most places in the U.S. in the U.S. too, or a lot of them, like you can't, it's the same thing. They keep the alcohol and the beer separate. I mm -hmm. still don't understand why, but there <laughs> are like a cluster of states that you run into where that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah weird yeah do you know is why? there I don't know why. what is what is what is the deal with that i don't i don't know i think uh i don't know like i think i feel like at least in canada like we just we're an entirely different beast because sure. like you know like i remember one of the first times walking into a walmart in the states and seeing like oh this is where you buy the guns and i'm like what well, like 
that would that would just it was just so yeah, uh, eye opening and 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 strange for me being like it is strange. This yeah. would just be the larger like toys section at the Walmart. I don't right, know. right. <laughs> If anything, yeah. the gun section at an American Walmart is the winter tire section at Canadian Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, especially like we have, we barely have Walmarts in LA because I don't think the demographic is good for the company. But if you go outside of LA, there's like a couple and they have gun sections, but they're really tiny. And then you have to go like these other Walmarts in like, I don't know, you go to one in Memphis, Tennessee or somewhere like that. And they have these crazy gun cases set up and stuff it's it's strange to me still yeah every time i see it I'm like, whoa like this is this is weird you can buy like chicken and a and your gun here <laughs> yeah. you think you're gonna stuff the chicken with uh you know some breadcrumbs no i'm just gonna put a just a gun inside that's gonna be my you know that's gonna be my safe place um well we're, we're getting super off the rails as far as conversation was oh, yeah. so let's kind of bring it bring it back let's, let's get back on Track. So, uh, Michael, uh, whenever I have a new guest who's never been on our, on our show before, I always like to get a little bit of context about how they got into metal, heavy music, hardcore, however you want to spin it. So, um, you know, you've done a, a plethora of podcasts yourself, so feel free to make it like the Coles Notes version, the super long uh, laid out version, or kind of a mixture of two. Uh, just just give me some um, some some history lessons about your heavy music origin story. Yeah, dude. Um, so I was always playing music since I was born. Like my earliest memory is like three, four years old, um, playing drums and playing music and I had drum sets and all that stuff. My dad was a musician, so that was like a huge component and rock music and live music was my thing and got really serious about it and like middle school and freshman year and there was a venue near my house called the coal vault which i've like brought this up before most people some people know about this venue and how it pertains to volumes and helping us do our thing and stuff like that so sure this place was kind of like a haven for me and a bunch of kids that were really into metal and punk and mainly actually like punk and like like or like post hardcore music and stuff like early 2000s i'm 32 so i was born in 90 so this was like 2000 2000 or yeah 2000 2001 two, three. and uh there was just this whole scene there and uh i was really drawn to it and it exposed me to like heavy music like i would go to shows and listen to really really crazy bands like all these insane like <laughs> Like it'll be like a Christian straight edge hardcore band and then like a ska band and then like a proper punk band in one night. Some nights would just be all metal and stuff like that. And uh, at the at the at that point, I was listening to like a lot of emo stuff and lighter music, but going to heavier shows and being exposed to that environment mm -hmm. and uh, kind of got over the the lighter stuff real quick. And then I started getting a lot more into heavy music and then uh, just kept going to those shows and going home and like downloading music all night long, like heavy music and just diving into like, I was using like Kazaa and like, uh, like, like download torrents and stuff like that at the time mm -hmm. and just immersing myself in all these crazy bands. And then I got myself in my first band and it kind of just spiraled from there. And that band started opening shows at the Cobalt. And then that introduced me to like, friends to this day that i have were just come out that just came out of that scene like um just like a handful of bands that stopped playing or there's a couple of them are still active but for the most part it was um kind of my group for life that i got introduced to by starting this band when i was like a freshman in high school and we started mm -hmm. opening shows and then i met the volumes boys and it was kind of a wrap from there um yeah that was the the quickest cliff notes i could give. <laughs> yeah uh, that there's yeah. a lot more to it but yeah i was just always really obsessed with music and knew i was gonna like wanted to be in a band and wasn't really down to like jam but i was like trying to be more serious like a lot of my friends had like drum sets in their room and guitars and amps and stuff and i was mm -hmm. always like looked down on that for some re reason even though i had the same 
set up. But yeah, I was just always like really serious. I went to a really tiny Catholic school and there was no exposure to any of this stuff there. Like it was very like cookie cutter. So I had to like go out of my way and hang out with like different kids, which is hard to do when you're young and stuff. So I I had to like, yeah, find my, my own tribe basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. I think the, the two things that I want to break down there, the first being like, just when, whenever you're downloading music through LimeWire or, or torrents or things like that, I just always had just like, I feel like that's may, maybe the, the early seeds of anxiety for a lot of people because it's like you click one thing and then there's a pop up and you're trying to close that and you're trying to do this and you're just like playing a little yeah. bit of um, you're just dancing around, not trying to get viruses on your on your parents computer or whatever um, sure, so yeah. that. Uh, but then uh, something that's interesting that you said that I and, and you can clarify this where you were saying. I wasn't down to jam with people, but I was like really serious about that. So was that like the people that were asking you to jam, you could kind of just tell like, this isn't really gonna, we either don't see eye to eye or like, it's just gonna be us dicking around versus like, I actually want to be in something that has a vision and and can actually build up a, a momentum. Is that correct or am I off base? Anyway? Yeah, no, that's confusing what I said. Uh, it was more, yeah, it was more like um, the not like, people that would like be like let's get stoned and jam sure and i'd be like no like i actually am doing this like on saturdays and sundays and shit like i i you know what i mean so i was i was just like um hanging out with a lot of kids that were just like (laughs) like fucking on like wholesome and honest and like wanted to like hang out with me and jam and i was like no fuck that dude like i'm serious i'm like really serious and I was like 12 or whatever. So I just had that, like, <laughs> I had that like thing in me that was like, really, I was like really serious about it. Um, which I'm not like a serious guy, like, but when it comes to like music, I've always been like that. I've always been like, <laughs> treated like a job. So mm. yeah, that, that's what I was, I was saying, but I was all, yeah. I mean, I was, there's so many bands that I was in, that I was in that like, didn't do anything, like literally didn't make it out of like a lockout or a practice space, but we were like jamming for like a year. So sure. like totally, yeah. totally jamming. Yeah. All, all the totally jamming dude all the time. <laughs> all the uh, time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I'm having flashbacks to a lot of very early yeah. moments for myself where it's like, yeah, like it was fun to do this when we were all like 13 or 14 years old. Sure. But like, I, like, I feel like I'm at the most, uh, activity level when it comes to playing in bands, doing this podcast, filming shows. And then i I, I'm ironically still friends with these people on, on Facebook and maybe they still listen to metal, but they're like not doing anything. So I think it's yeah. just maybe something that's wired in you to like, no, I actually want to take this outside of like the basement, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's really, and it's interesting, like being like we, I grew up like 27 miles outside of like Hollywood, LA downtown. So it felt like, like I come from like a small city like it, it's not really like that anymore but when I was growing up there it was like felt really tiny like really tiny like and mm. it's a very it's called it's like Wood, West Hills mainly like that's kind of, that's it's Woodland Hills like everyone kind of knows like a lot of celebrities live there now but that's recent like when I grew up there it was pretty quiet and mellow just like suburban mm. and I was on the West Hill side of it and it was just this tiny little like seven mile suburban area that we all grew up in and it was just so small and anyone that like was doing music or playing at like anything creative like do like whether it's filming like visuals and stuff like that too no one was really doing visuals then but like movies and stuff we all like knew who they were and what they were doing it was like weirdly competitive but the people that stopped like moved on to do like like i have buddies that are writing for comedy central now just based on the proximity of like where we are to hollywood and stuff like that so it was like this small town vibe but if you stopped there you're you're fine like you're doing a, like most most of the people i knew are, are are doing stuff like that now that are like have like families and kids and like own homes and are very much like embedded into in, in the entertainment industry so that was a, kind of a weird part of it too is the people that were with us coming up and took like like we went on to get signed whatever great for us but then like their paths individually 
really interesting and I, a lot of them I still keep up with and yeah it's it's cool to see that like them doing good and shit yeah totally and yeah I think it's you know even if someone is in the in the band space for a minute in the grand scheme of of all this stuff that's going on it doesn't mean that they're actually built for it and you know some people have those moments where they're like you know there's been plenty of uh vocalists or guitar players or drummers that have left bands because they're like their band blew up and they're like i i'm actually i don't want to be touring all this i'm not down for this yeah yeah Yeah, totally so i but i do think that having some of those people uh who maybe live a different uh style of life but you can still you know touch base with and you know not oh, like yeah. comparing the two as as right or wrong but at least you know having having a sense of um you know having people in your court who are gonna humble you but also cheer for you at the same time dude that's the cool part about getting old like if any i mean that's what i would tell any young person that's like doesn't like i don't know that's like not down to turn 30 or, i mean it's it's cool to see like things just get naturally like serious and it's cool to see where people end up. And then, yeah, you have friends that are, that you catch up with that are doing like your, like friends, like I'm a touring musician. That's cool. That's something that I never thought I would happen for me. It did. And then I'm like sitting down with a buddy of mine that's works at Comedy Central, basically developing all these TV shows, something that is like you would have asked us when we were teenagers, we would have been like, right. No, this is not going to be a thing. So little little moments like that that I trip out on. And it's always cool to kind of like carry that with you and reflect. So you like stay humble and shit. And yeah. Totally. Realize how hard it was to, to do that ultimately to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let, let's kind of, you know, we'll fast forward a little bit into, you know, you link up with the volumes, guys. You guys get signed, really yeah. transforms the band. Um, volumes to me... Because like one of the biggest influences for me in in like this uh, type of music that we all listen to definitely is like Linkin Park. So like the idea of like two vocalists, you know, with different styles and different kind of focal points of what people are focusing on was always apparent to me. And I think Volumes was one of the first bands to do that in a much more like metal centric heavy sense. So, you know, what is the best and worst part about having two vocalists in a band? The best part is that's like such a good question. No one's ever asked me. That's probably the best question I've ever gotten asked. On a, I dog thinks I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, dude. I think the worst part is probably like riding gets a little hectic. It can get a little hectic because there's just like vocalists, strong personalities typically. And I mean, me and Mike are boys. Like we don't, it's not like we clash hard but it's just as far as like there's so much idea and content to sift through best part shows the shows are so fun um having two guys on stage like honestly like i yeah i'm like i don't i feel like i'm by myself in a does that make sense like in a weird way like it's so fun that i feel like it's my band and i hope he feels like that as far as like it doesn't it's just for volumes it's like we're we're so doing our own thing Marty. that i think it comes off like that i just feel like, like i'm up there alone sometimes because we don't really like have we don't push the the i guess the clichéness of like two vocals and like looking at each other and stuff like we do naturally but does that make sense like it's weird like sometimes i'm having so much fun i'm just like zoned out and like feeling the energy that i'm like like this is yeah i'm up here doing my thing he's doing his thing so when i turn and i see him i honestly reminded oh there's someone else in this band sure (laughs) like this is sick Mm -hmm. and then i get stoked and so i have those like blackout moments where that's that's really fun to me is where i'm like oh shit yeah i forgot mike's up here and then i run over to him that's Mm -hmm. i find works best for us and the most natural than like jumping at the same time or yeah. Something. Like, yeah yeah so it's 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 almost it's as simple as like two guitar players being in the band and like knowing that you know like there's yeah it's not like 
oh, I have to play this riff and then it goes to him and we're being intentional that way. And I think it's like just heightened that much more because the vocalists have the, anyone who's doing vocals has much more freedom to move around. You're commanding the crowd, trying to like orchestrate the the energy to a degree. Um, but I've always loved seeing, you know, like from the early stages of the band, even to recently, just like being able to see how people can, um, the energy can just double when there's when there's two people in the mix so yeah. yeah yeah but but to your point the the first thing as far as just like writing and you know because like is it because you know you're there's probably a split thing for like it's not 50 50 for every single song it's you know 70 30 or 60 40 so like like, how do you, does that come just organically with you too? Or does, does it need to be atten- intentional about setting the, the, the varying degrees of that? Um, we really just kind of do it by feel. Like for reference, I wrote, dog's got to come in, dude. Yeah, it's dog's got to come in. It's, it's funny because my, my smaller oh, dog, she'll just barrel in. Like the door is not I wish that. I wish that happened. That would have been way sick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she did it on the, the episode I recorded before you, but uh so this good. one's a little yeah. bit more more timid. Yeah, I'm like okay. Yeah, yeah, you are. I'm like, I'll stop this interview right now and just talk about dogs. For <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like fully immersed with them. But um yeah, dude, I think like I like he wrote an entire song on their on our on the record that we just put out. Um the seed again sing uh, track and then like i wrote him some songs too so I, it's it kind of just we just go off a of vibe and what feels good like if i don't have it i don't have it and if he has it he has it vice versa um yes i you know and then on on this we're we're you know gearing up to write more music i think we're gonna do try to do it more regimented like 50 50 and get more even more organized um but for happier um it was very, very just like we're showing up, we're writing in the studio. We're not taking, we took stuff home and stuff like that. But yeah, it was very much like all of it was left there. And that was kind of a new way for me to work, but I liked it. I don't think I'll work like that again. I like taking stuff home, but mm. um, that was just, there was also a plethora of problems. We were like doing it during a pandemic and it just kind of had to be like that work out that way um Mm -hmm. but yeah it's there's no real like real split we just we're very 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 like cool and cognizant of each other yeah do you think having another vocalist in the band has like helped just like not like center you is probably not the right word but just kind of like have have you approach being a vocalist like with more empathy or just like a different way because i think I've just heard you every everybody's got like that one story with um uh like a vocalist who's being a diva or like singeritis or things like that. So I'm I'm curious if having another person that is sharing that responsibility with you has like influenced you in a in a positive way. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean <laughs> like I've that was me early on in this whole thing, this whole career mm-hmm. was I was going on tour not talking to anybody, being super competitive, being super aggressive when I didn't need to be. I got called out by a huge vocalist, uh, almost sent home. Like, so, and I totally like had that experience. And I've also been on the other side of it um, with two vocalists. And, and uh, you know, at the time, like we had a kind of a, checkered reputation and kind of a really like loose on both ends reputation and I think most people thought that I wasn't I didn't have my hand in it but like get on tour with me and you saw that I was like just as a weird aggressive like inside person so I learned pretty quick like that's that's not what you do and that's not okay and you can't be that dude um and at that time, I didn't really have like the people around me in my band to really like help because we were all confused and young and scared and just scared and just out there trying to like impress and be a man and grow up all at the same time, which is a recipe for just fucking nothing good. Um, this time around, though, it's it is 
it's cool having like that experience and then coming back to the band with the second vocalist and um now we're like holding each other accountable because like stuff still happens and tour is tour and you're gonna have bad days and things blow up in your face and parties that aren't expected and just whatever you know people sure. get drunk people don't get drunk like some people do other shit it's all a zoo and now that we've had like kind of some you know 10 years under our belt uh mike's mike a little more we we kind of uh yeah it balances each other out and now we're very like everyone everyone in the band like holds each other accountable and that's like so refreshing and humbles me every day like if i'm going through a ptsd tour moment of like being a diva or some shit like that mike's typically the dude that will chill like me or anyone out so he's definitely a good guy to have like mm -hmm. on the road just as like a piece of the puzzle that's very very easy going and and chill yeah so to clarify for me your the second vocalist name is also mike <laughs> yeah i mean yeah so mike mike took my spot and then now i'm back in the band with mike so right. that was already funny because like the name didn't change like there was there was like <laughs> a new face but same name just spelled slightly differently like he spells mm -hmm. it with y but yeah now now <laughs> now there's two mics and that's just like of course right like of course there is do you have like an internal like name code of like no like do people call you bar instead or like people call you know? me bar. a lot of people call me bar most Got people you as a go-to it's happened my whole life i used to hate it and now i don't give a shit but why did you get that well it's your last name but why did you hate it uh i don't like know originally? i just so it either like i don't know if anyone can relate to this but my whole entire life people would say my full name i don't know why like no one and like other people have said this too to me being like yeah that's true like everyone always says your full name ever since i was a kid was always Michael Barr and it tripped me out because the next person was just like Rachel or fucking Jack or whatever right. always always full <laughs> right so my thing my thing was like oh my name's really short so that's why people just throw it in there because it's four it's like fucking four letters yeah so, so I think people just call me Barr because of that because it's like Barr but it's shorter people are like yeah I don't care about it now. It reminds me of being on like a fucking football team or something. Hey, sure. bar. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I throw yes. you a long one there, bud? Yeah. Uh, What's up? Yeah, yeah. What do you need? Yeah, that that yeah. I feel I feel like when I never really got that because my last name <laughs> I would say sixty seven percent of people would always mispronounce it. So I would I always like What's that? How you pronounce your last name? So yeah, L let's just put it on record for everyone. So it's Priest, but most people say Prize because they see P R I E S and they think of French fries, so they yeah. say Prize. But it's Priest without the T, essentially. Yeah, Priest makes sense though. So as you said, it, it's like, oh yeah, that's that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh. So we we've hit on some of the the vocalist stuff. Um. I think something that's really interesting with with volumes especially when you guys were initially coming out like that whole like i think gent and like all that like form of metal if you want to call it was like just it was it was very new in my opinion and i think it's like definitely evolved and blossomed and like taken new lanes of itself so when you think about like when you guys originally got signed and you started to put out your like first couple albums and you look at where you guys are now do you feel like the sound of the band was early or like right on time when things uh, were get were gaining that popularity? Ooh, that's a really good question too. Um, I think early. I think early only because, um, like, when we started the band, I was like two thousand two thousand six, two thousand seven. And um, I was approached by Daniel Bronstein and Diego, and they were really into like Meshuggah and those tones. 
and I remember being like, what's Meshuga? I have no idea. Just like, oh, these, this sounds great. Like these, this is the crunchiest tone I've heard. And um, yeah, I'm in like, let's do this. This I want to see where this goes. So I think like, we didn't know really about at that time, it would have been like really beyond Meshuga and Misha with Bulb. And at Bulb, I think we found out after we started the band, I think we were listening to Bulb after. So I mean, it doesn't really fucking matter, but we definitely like, we would never pull the card and be like, oh yeah, we helped coin the genre or anything like that. Um, But I think we were subconsciously a part of it without us knowing. And like, we definitely talk about that all the time, how, oh yeah, we were like early one of the bands fully getting behind the sound. So Mm. it's, that's, that's like one thing that is like a little trophy to me that I'm like, oh yeah, it's cool to be a part of something like that you can objectively be like, yeah, this, this, <laughs> that was a long time ago. And we, we were coining this shit before um, it was, or you know, before it was cool, you know, we were doing it before it wasn't. And even, you know, we were getting shunned on shows and just like all that silly stuff like early on because we had that sound and that wasn't like a post hardcore sound or a hardcore band or metal core. It was more like melodic and stuff like that. But I think that was part of the reason why like a song like intake at that time really, really impacted people or like edge of the earth because it's like jumped that next step of like misery signals. So you know, volumes to me is a hybrid of Meshuggah and Misery Signals, like point blank, basically mm-hmm. early on. And that was, yeah, like that was the sound that we really, I mean, Canada, that was a sound that we really gravitated towards. And yeah, so I mean, a long winded explanation for early. So, so. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I appreciate you breaking it down because it is that thing where like a band on, on the on the aftermath of it all can be like, oh, yeah, like we, you know, we like we kind of paved the road for a lot of not like in a selfish way but like really like yo there are bands that are like really blowing up because it's like established now like i can't even imagine what like um you know because it's it's the same conversation for any of like the new metal bands at the beginning who were like who are these freaks with masks playing this like aggressive music and that laid the groundwork for for so many of us Right, but, right, right. you know, to your point, like you said, like, it's cool on the aftermath to be able to look back and say, like, yeah, yeah, we were early. And that's kind of a cool thing to to be able to self-reflect. But at the begin, you know, in the days where you're actually early, it feels like, why are we getting so many grievances that we don't sound like, you know, sure. a rise core kind of kind of band? Like, yeah, yeah I mean, th- that was one thing that. I think we enjoyed too, as we were like, we didn't want to stick out. We, you know, we're like, when you're fucking 18, you don't want to stick out really. You want to blend in more. So, you know, I think it's different now. I think kids like want to really, like really stick out, but when, yeah, (laughs) you know what I mean? But yeah, you just wanted to blend in as much as possible. And sonically, like as a band, like we were just kind of like, eh, like there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of the same bands playing shows. Like, let's do two vocalists like and that came from like we like me and Gus at the time were super to set your goals so like that was yeah, like that's, that's a great weird, yeah that totally that people probably thought it was for like a despised icon situation or something and mm-hmm. it was another can another uh band Canada right and yeah. yeah so just stuff like that where we were like not really like trying to go against the grain but we were just like came from a hub and came from a situation where we're really inspired by like a multitude of things and um wanted to kind of like always pump that into to volumes and kind of be the band that does things like slightly differently the way we Mm -hmm. dress the way you know like wearing like fucking oh my god we're wearing like baggy jeans and like flat like look like skater boys and stuff like that on stage or whatever like like Fairfax early 2000s LA stuff yeah I was like I mean it was at the time we were like this is a lot of fun and no one looks like this so we just like took those like little spaces and opportunities for ourselves but I think it was always authentic even when we would get hated on even when we still get hated on 
volumes has always stayed like at least when I was always in the band tried to stay as authentic as possible to like who we are and where we came from even if it was detrimental <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. yeah um you know uh, you you were kind of alluding to it, and I listened to on on uh, I listened to a quote of yours on another uh, on another podcast you did, and you were saying how um, uh, volumes wasn't ready to jump into the world of being a successful band and touring, and there's a beauty in that. Can you kind of like break that down as like you know now you know many like your your first major release is like ten years old now, and I'm sure you've been able to like look back and, and self-reflect on a lot of those things so like it, it is crazy to see how bands now can drop something on twitter and like blow up and then like they're the hottest shit and people are like wanting to fly them all over the world and that can be daunting if you're 16 17 18 years old so like tell me about like right. a lot of those early days for you and what you felt like you did right and what you think you could obviously do better if, you know, time travel, uh, you sure. know, jump into the time machine and, and go slap young Michael and be like, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. I totally. I have more of those moments than, <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I think that, you know, quote or, you know, what, whatever I, um, that's just like, I think I can only, I mean, in full transparency, just say that because I, I'm in a situation where I'm lucky enough to like go back to a band that I started when I was essentially like a kid mm -hmm. and have like a, the perspective of being 32. And I don't think a lot of people get that opportunity. So I know that. And um, with that being said, I think uh, it's, it's, yeah, you, you, you get to see things full circle. And I kind of felt that when I was departing, like I, I, I felt like myself getting older and maturing, but I, that's, I just didn't feel the band uh, doing it in my direction that I was heading in. But I, but you feel the wear and tear and you kind of just feel like, okay, I've been doing this for a minute. We've been doing this for six years, five to six, seven years. And um, I just, I, I don't think I departed early, but um, when I did leave, I was kind of, always hung up on like oh how am I going to feel about this in like five or five years never thinking or you know longer let's say eight years I was like I've never I I don't know if I'm going to feel good about this and like I never thought I would be asked to you know or a situation would pan out the way it did so yeah, I think it's I think like that's my perspective but I but I also think like for anyone that's even just in a band that like stopped or broke up and which we all know there's plenty of those. And I have plenty of friends and buddies that were in bands that I toured with and that I loved and are not touring anymore. And I think, I think it's, it's just like nice to be okay with like not being in a band or be, or, or like acknowledging the fact that you aren't the most successful band right now or at the current time to me i feel like that's the better sign and i'm like more in line to the like i don't know support and listen to someone's music that has a hone on it like that rather than kind of some like minor almost feels like propaganda that bands push on you that they are bigger than they are or they've had these milestones like it's for us for me coming back in the band i was like hey we're gonna just like like we're doing interviews, we're doing stuff. If anyone just like asks us anything, like we're just going to like, we're going to fucking talk about it. Like just talk about it, own it. That's going to better our whole situation. That's going to be better for all of us. So I think with just how honest and open we are about like everything that's happened and transpired and who we're trying to be moving forward and the music that we make and the way we dress and all that stuff and like stuff we were joking about like five minutes ago, mm. that's kind of like what I'm getting at is like, it's, there's if you're lucky enough and you can stick it out and you do go through all this crazy hectic shit hopefully there's a clearing for for most bands and like for us where things calm down and you get that moment to like still be a part of something and look back and see how much it's grown so that's kind of like the beautiful part in this whole crazy music industry 
which is hard to be in, right? Like it's, it's, it's not easy being in a band and it looks, sometimes it can look effortless or like we're having more fun than you or someone watching this, but for like most guys I know, and for us personally, like, I mean, I work a day job to keep this going. So it's, it's kind of just like sitting in that and being okay with not having a bus every tour, not having a private jet and like really being looking at this as like, I want to do this for as long as I can. Every tour is going to be different. Every year is going to be different. Every first week is going to be different. Um, like first week album sales. So yeah, yeah, I got you. That's kind of like, I'm thankful to have that perspective on it now because now I'm having the most fun I've had in a band is relief of all the fucking, you know, superficial bullshit that, you think you have to be or achieve when you're like in an independent band that plays a niche genre of music, which is screaming when the biggest predominant genre is rap and like EDM, you know, like those sure. are very, very, <laughs> right. very important to like understand and you'll be more successful and be bigger if you do, you know? Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch uh, to unpack there, but I, I, I really like how you said like, Every first week sales will be different for every release. Every year will be different. And I think that's like, yeah, that's really important to be like, yeah, like if um, obviously there's if you're planning like your debut record or your next, you know, follow up record, like, yeah, there's like you want people to be chatting about it, coming to see you for the rollout. And there's like all these plans that get set in place to, you know, get the, you know, the excitement and the hype up. Um, but at the same time, like, I think that there is nothing wrong when bands put something out and they like really, you know, promote the shit out of it and whether it does good or bad to still be able to like, you know, we exist, but we don't need to like be screaming from the rooftops like, hey, look at us when, you know, you don't have like that big thing that's happening. Um, you know, if anything, it's there's there's too much happening. Like, yeah. sometimes I'll be like. Uh, like I, I have a, a Spotify and Apple playlist uh, that I'm curating yearly of just like new releases. And I always just like toss stuff into there. And I, the amount of days that I find one new song that I know that was being announced. And then I like, Oh, this band also re released this. And then this split came out and this band did a re-recording of this song. And it's just like, it's overwhelming at times. So yeah. I think being aware, like you said, like bands can exist, but it doesn't need to be this constant, like the the trajectory is not just a straight incline. I think that there yeah. are moments of, you know, it's it's literally the same, you know, it's funny because I send Jordan, our, our podcast producer, uh, when we get like a big guest and we get a lot of lessons, like if there's a crazy spike. So, but like if you zoom out, everything's been going up, but there's been lots of this over yeah, time, totally, you know? Totally. Yeah, I mean, I think even if you're a band that has... Like, personally, I think volume still has a lot of work to do. I wouldn't say that we have broken through any real thing yet, except just being around for a really fucking long time and having awesome shows, making good music. But let's say, like, I don't know, like, every time I die, like, they're, you know, rest in peace. Love that band. Very upset that um, they broke up. But, like, if you're a band like that or any, you know, uh, like, Under Oath or something, I almost feel like it's, you don't want to be doing too much like if you're that if you're fortunate to have been a, be successful and be in that category do numbers have sold out shows it's almost better to like go away like and do like plan moments where you're gonna like not be present now in 20 in this year you know what i mean like i feel like two years ago three years ago it might have been a little different but now i feel like the the mystique or the mysterious is is more does more than constantly promoting something or getting people hyped up and ready like everyone's had so much of that the last like 15 years 10 you know with social media that I think everyone's exhausted and that's why songs get shorter you know things are like finite you know um which which is good in some aspects but yeah, I think everyone's just like attention spans have gotten very, very short, which is like translated into people thinking they need to bombard and pump the system when like 
I like for volumes, like we're, we are trying to be a band and have that luxury of like not having to, it's a battle. I mean, you have things like TikTok and you have things like not obligated, but opportunities and avenues you can take to like further promote and self-promote the product. But we're so like, we truly don't want to do it. Like we're truly are like, ah, oh, like we want to be a band that's like super behind the scenes, put something out and smashes. It's not going to work that way. We're going to have to do all the bullshit. But if, you know, that's something that I think is like, to me, that is like better than having the system work like that for you. It's better than having like a fucking plaque on the wall. I don't know, like, um, like, you know, all these accolades and stuff that, you know, come with like being in a band stream songs and, and stuff like that. I think it, you're winning if you aren't working a day job and you don't have to put yourself out there that much. Like that mm. to me is, is the sauce. Yeah. Yeah. We want that sauce. <laughs> I mean, everyone does. Right. <laughs> you're right. But there's bands I know that, yeah, like they crush and most dudes stopped working their job or, or never did. And um, yeah, they're just, they don't, they don't have to like pander to, it's nice. It doesn't have, it's not every band, but sometimes you get like a situation where you're just like, not, you're, you're so like, you just to the core, like know your product and know who you are as a band or a group or, you know, an outfit, if you will. And you don't have to like sell yourself out too much and you still are successful and it's lucrative and you don't have to work that job but wouldn't that be nice yeah if we all <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know one of the earlier points that you said like you know we're not most hardcore bands or most bands in our our space are not like you know it's it's like it's mind-blowing when it's like a band like turns out get offered to play Coachella or something like that. Cause that it's so like, it's so alien. It's so just like on Mars that like no one was expecting that it makes sense because of their trajectory and how things are going, but it's still like, so like, you know, there's not 10 bands being asked. It's like this one band that's being, you know, sent off to them. So yeah, like th having the, the uh, realizing that, yeah, like, there's obviously things have changed in a way that, yeah, maybe you need to have some kind of job. Um, and at the same time, as long as you can be doing something that, you know, maybe you're making money uh, or doing something when you're not touring, as long as that still fills up your cup to a degree and you can don't have major conflicts when you get called out to go on the road, I think that still is, is sick. Because I think, I don't know about you, but I think for me, I would... Like I do go crazy when I don't have shit to do. So even if my band isn't going and doing stuff, it's like I need to do this podcast. I need to fucking edit live sets. I need to like concoct yeah. beverages. Like I I need stuff to do, and you know, you know, rest is obviously important as well. But I I don't know what balance uh, you're at when it comes to that. Oh man, it's so out of whack lately. Like some days I'm like. <sighs> Fuck all of this. Like, I'm just going to live under a fucking rock, dude. Like, I'm like, so <laughs> just like full Patrick dude, star get, mode, dude. I get, <laughs> I get so aggressively just done at like nine in the morning. And my girlfriend will be like, you're, this is, you need to like, you need to pull it together. Cause this shit is not, nothing's changed. Nothing's going anywhere. But, um, yeah, dude, I think, I think I, I just, I, I tow, I tow both lines to be honest, you know? So, mm. yeah. yeah. So, um, let's talk about, uh, the new record. So, um, happier. I, I really liked like the covers really, really bright. You got like the clear kind of, you know, mass to it. So what's like sure. the biggest thing that you want, like fans of the band to understand about the release? Um, so yeah, I think uh, we, I think we just want to make sure that it's taken as like we are getting back to something that is like more wholesome sonically than like ever before. Um, anything that we've put out, I think that's like the main takeaway, at least that I would like people to, to walk away with. 
Mm. Uh, the cover and the faces and stuff like that. Honestly, like it, I was like, let's, what if we did like a face for each member? Um, and it was just a quick thought like that. Got the mock up, looked great, went that direction. Like there's really no like crazy ass, you know, whole breakdown with that. Um, sure. Yeah, like we, it helps that there's, you know, the, the number of members there are right now and that we could like use the space and it looks good. Honestly, if there was like one more, I would be like, oh, it's too crowded. So yeah, it just like felt, it just felt good and looked clean. Um, but yeah, for, for, for this album, I think it's just, it's really imperative that like we are a different type of band. And that's just like the main thing when we were writing, we just wanted to make sure that was the the consensus when you're listening to it is like it obviously doesn't sound any it like it it's updated there's an updated sound but there's a lot of old stuff happening and nostalgic going on and with that happening we wanted to also be clear like oh it's a whole new ball game too so you have like you know the nods to via and no sleep and there's a lot of like that type of songwriting and mixing going on and then a lot of kind of new you know chorus and melodic parts being introduced to you at the same time. I always uh, like to ask this question because, um, especially with bands with lots of um, different releases, a, 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 pl- a good discography, um, have, have you gotten to play any of the songs off of Happier Live yet? Or We've got some, mm, like, yeah, like two or three. One okay. wasn't out, one wasn't out, but the other two, like we did Bend and we did what was the other one we did that came out um no okay so yeah we just did we honestly just played like one technically two on the on the tour yeah okay got you so uh i always like to ask this question and and you know we can either include or exclude um songs off the new record what is the most underrated volume song and what is the most overrated volume song from 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 your perspective Easy, overrated, edge of the earth, completely overrated. <laughs> um, the, the, I would say there's a song called Neon Eyes on No Sleep. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's the end breakdown um, on that song is like, still to this day is to me the coolest audible part of volumes that exists. And we try to do something like that on this um record there's we did a song called into you that's like into you parentheses hurt and at the end of that song there's like it's like the the song is very poppy but then we the end we threw in this like it's silly almost it's so insanely heavy the end of that song and that was an inspiration from neon eyes from no sleep so i'd say that's the most slept on for sure i got you it's always funny when i ask this question because some people really struggle but you went you're like i know I know the overrated song immediately. <laughs> Being a band with me is like really tough and hard because I'm so like, I talk so much shit about most of the stuff. That we do. <laughs> but I think that's how that, I don't know. I don't know what that is with me, but that's like how I might cope with, I don't fucking know. But yeah, like Edge of the Earth, I'm like, that's what it is. Like if it gets popular, I'm, I just gravitate towards the, 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 the other, the right. latter. Yeah. Yeah, because it's always that thing where most big songs that are the breakout songs for bands like like were never intended to be that. Yeah. And everyone hates playing them. And it's a whole thing. That's kind of like we I'm not we're not like that. We like wormholes, for instance, like I fucking did like fucking hate playing that song. Like but (laughs) like in all actuality, like it's the funnest part of our set, probably. So that's when like that's when like pranks get pulled and shit like that. Right. Because it is your most lack song you play. Everyone knows and like whatever I could sing it in my yeah. sleep. So that's when like, that's an environment that you're, that you don't know, like you, and that's this whole kind of thing that I think that has been like, you, you asked me a question about how you operate and stuff like that, where it's like, like you're playing a song and you hate it and you're like, those fucking lyrics and stuff like that. But subconsciously like you're autopilot. So like, to me, that's like, I'm just, fully like i don't have to think so i'm running over here i'm like letting go more letting loose more and i would that's like a huge lesson where i'm like get over it play the good play the song everyone wants to hear like i if i was paying 
to see volumes. That's the only song I would want to come for, right? <laughs> Edge of the Earth and Wormhole. So you kind of just have to like accept it and just roll with it and have fun. And and like, yeah, you see how happy people get. Like you're up there like translating in a total different way. Like you're going, yeah. this, you shouldn't be doing this. And everyone's like, wow, like I've I've waited five years to hear you play Wormholes, man, with you in the band. Now you're back. Thank you so much. You're just like, okay, I need to chill. <laughs> chill. Uh, you you mentioned um uh when it's a comfortable song, that's most likely when pranks are pulled. What yeah. what what kind of pranks are we talking? Well, you want to choose a song. You want to choose the song that's like either like the silliest song in the set or like the last one, which typically like your, the last song is your biggest song. You've played it a thousand million times. So mm. yeah, like on this tour of varials, um, I, well, they only played a couple of pranks on us, but that was just like, you know, it's the, it's the end of the set, I guess. And that's, that vibe is always fun and good because all the stress is over and you've made it right. through all the stuff that you're ruminating all day over and practicing before you get on stage and just calls for a good time. Right. Yeah. So, so no standout pranks that have been pulled on. Oh, you or, okay. Or... Sorry. Sorry. I'm like, you're, are you I'm like, me? that's the, that's the juicy stuff that people want to hear. Uh, who who got got? Also, no, it's you're also kidding. exhausting to do an interview with me. Also being in a band with me sucks. Um, no, I'm having yeah, fun. So... <laughs> um i guess like i honestly we haven't been pranked that badly because we've only done like a couple it's usually like the headlining band that gets pranked on this tour we've only done like two headliners on this one i think the last day like it's so uh stupid and cliche because this has been done a thousand times but like the whole tour package ran up on stage but we were super super pissed off at this point of tour as a group we were which everyone can relate to or people that are in the touring industry we just had that cluster those couple shows where we're just like not feeling it people are sick and or just not doing good um and we got pranked that night because everyone knew but they only did they did that because it was like dude we can't do anything crazy we just need to run on stage with these dudes because they're they'll literally like someone will like kill me or get <laughs> But if I can think of any other, like, other pranks that were done that were pretty gnarly, there's this one, like, that I always hear about, and I think it's, like, a, I think it was Ronnie Racky and another band, but he, like, filled someone's, I forget what band, but they filled someone's tour bus up with, like, moving peanuts, like, the packaging oh, peanuts. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whole thing. And to me, that's like epic. That it's like the most epic. <laughs> until you're cleaning, like until he's like, "All right, see you later." And like, yeah, yeah. Then you guys are cleaning it out, and you can't say anything because you're on his headlining tour. But uh, that's yeah, funny. I think that one to me is like the most epic tour burn mm. or prank. Yeah, I, like, cool. are there any pranks? Well, I was just gonna ask you what what's like one prank that you would not want but then if you say it then it most likely might happen in the future Ooh, um I, like, I, I like like i'm, I'm thinking like i don't fuck with silly I string say, yeah, i don't want to get that in my it, hair <laughs> if i say it someone might do it to me that's why i'm scared to say it but right <laughs> i guess someone like messing with my biggest fear would be someone messing with the like my mic or my or something like that in real time because I oh, get okay. super, super weird and stressed. If I knew it was a joke, I wouldn't. Honestly, I'd be like, keep it going. I don't care. But in the moment, I know myself and I get really tripped out. Mm -hmm. I hear something like that. So if someone were to do that, I'd be like, oh, like I wouldn't want to ruin the joke. I would honestly want the joke to happen on me. But um, <laughs> That's what that would be my that would be my fear. I guess like something with with toying with the set and like me not knowing that's be and then me like getting mad at someone when it's just a, a joke. Yeah, I don't want to be. Yeah. Well, that yeah, that's a little bit more like you're actually just messing with my actual like performance versus like oh we all came on stage and we're all like you know trying to guitar along to, yeah. to Edge of the Earth or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, scary, scary would be a good one if you scare me on stage. That'd be good. Someone needs to like hide in an amp or something and pop out. That's <laughs> just like bust out of like like a like a four twelve cab, like a cake. Just poof. Like dude gets in there like before we get on stage, or someone's like keeping that's us co- that's commitment to the bit for sure. You someone hollowed like someone switched out, or someone brought in like a hollowed out amp behind mm-hmm. you i would never know like i don't as a singer you have to do that on the singer because i like i don't set up like uh the amps or anything like you wouldn't even want me touching it mm-hmm. it so would be, be funny and, and again this is for anyone who's gonna go go on tour with volumes and, and wants to lay uh, it out but it would be funny if you were doing you know the yo this next song is blah 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 and then you turn around and like or like mid-song like there audibly isn't any changes, but you look behind and every like it's just like different members playing different shit. It's like drummer oh, from dude. this band is there, or or no one's everyone's just staring at me and not playing. That would be, <laughs> but yeah, that would be funny. Then it's like happy birthday, dude. I so Rod the last show we played, like he fucking turned into a psychopath on stage and was like i don't know why this happened but he was like following me around on stage for like fucking 50 like half of our set like 15 minutes while i'm singing like like here like next to me and stuff kind of like that will ferrell bit where he puts the cowbell like slowly like close into the singer's face yeah yeah (laughs) following me around I don't know why I'm saying it. It was just like, it was like, but it was like his own prank. Mm. It was like this last, the last show of the year that we were playing and he lost his fucking mind on stage and I was laughing. I wasn't even singing. I was just laughing. Like I stopped, <laughs> stopped singing, stopped caring about anything and whatever. And I was just laughing at him. Like I didn't even, I didn't even care mm. what was going on. And we just had this exchange of, I was like, what are you doing? Like talking to him on stage and he's just like, what? Come on. And like, fucking pushing me and like spinning on me and stuff and i was like all for it i was like dude you are in rare form let's go (laughs) yeah it's like the the temporary like um uh like what's what's the thing in digimon because i'm a pokemon head but there's like that thing in digimon where it's like it goes to that max state but then it's like temporary and then it kind of goes back I'm the um, wrong guy to be asking. <laughs> I was more Pokemon too. Like there, you had to pick, mm-hmm. and I like I was only in it because like I don't. It was cool. I don't know. Like yeah. I probably was in it because I wanted the fucking binder with the holograph like stickers. Beyond that, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to carry it around. <laughs> That's indicative of, of of like my personality and who I am. There you go. Like my mm. my Pokemon. <laughs> booklet was empty and i just had the fucking, the fucking stickers dude <laughs> mm. do you do you have a favorite pokemon like um uh wordle or tortoise war like tortle the, tor- the tortoise guy like the the most evolved one Blastoise. oh blastoise yeah yeah you got it Last toy was my. I was favorite. almost about to end this podcast if you uh, couldn't name it. I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and I played like Pokemon Snap. What an absurd game! What a really boring fucking game. And I play that <laughs> all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it literally is just taking pictures of Pokemon. Yet was super instrumental for people for some I reason. Think- oh, you know what? That was the fro- probably the like inspiration for um, the fucking what everyone was doing where they're going around with the vr and the pokemon like the, oh pokemon go go it's yeah, pokemon yeah. go before pokemon go yeah, yeah. pretty much anyway yeah. just- <laughs> <laughs> um so michael i also you know obviously volumes based in the los angeles area um, you know, it was funny, uh, a couple days as, you know, we were setting up this podcast, I saw that you shared, I think it was like a screen recording of like a, a TikTok of some person like, why do people in LA always say that yeah. they do music? And I was just, it was just coming from you as like an a- actual established musician. It was just very, very funny. So, um, tell me, 
So I, I, like I mentioned at the very top of the episode, I'm going to LA next week. Uh, I've only been to Anaheim, so this will be my first time in LA proper. So what's like the one spot I need to go to? And like, what's the one area that's overhyped and I should stay clear from? Wow. Um, overhyped would probably be at least so big. So there's multiple areas <laughs> that are overhyped. Right. Hollywood Boulevard like completely that's like the most touristy part super overhyped nothing really good on hollywood boulevard to go to and then like melrose is not that great i you know what i think it's all overhyped to be honest and i'm not trying LA, to sound like, the whole thing I'm is over sound like cool with the la hat on or sound um you know just to put you know like i'm not trying to be all cool but uh, i'm like yeah it's just changed a lot so there's a lot of overly hyped situations. Typically next to it or in the middle of it or some way on the way to the hype situation, there's gold, there's gems. There's a lot sure. of good shit in LA. I've lived here my whole life. So I've just seen a lot of, you know, I've seen it change in different areas. But um, yeah, like Melrose, Hollywood Boulevard, super overhyped. I would go to like, Silver Lake's really cool. Echo Park's really cool. Um, even like Burbank in the Valley, like it's very sleepy and mellow and there's a lot of like tiny little cool bars, but iconic LA spots that I would go to there's a spot called Felipe's in downtown, which are like Aju French dip sandwiches. It's been there since I think the depression or right after. Oh, wow. Okay. You, it has like sawdust on the floor everywhere. And there's these huge cases like, like cases that are like would have like cakes and stuff and they have like they have cakes but they have like potato salad and all of the all these like old timey dishes mm. and they only they only really serve like a couple of different sandwiches but mainly like three different kind of french dip sandwiches and that spot was like mind-blowing the waitresses are wearing like crazy ass outfits so check that they're <laughs> okay. like old they're all like 70 years old like it's one of those spots like super mm. old school like you have a waitress yelling at telling you what to order like those are my yes like fucking hurry up and you're like oh exactly. fuck, okay like, yeah, yeah. you know the deal so that yeah. that place is gold um what else there's there's a place around the corner um or there's a place nearby called canters which is a deli that place is really good. And then, like, do you drink? Yes. So if you like to drink, there's a bar called – there's a couple bars in Atwater Village. There's one called uh, Yee Tea Club, and there's another one called, like, the Bigfoot Bar. And they're all, like, kind of themed differently, and they were opened up in the 60s and 70s, and it's kind of, mm -hmm. like, where I am. So. Yeah. But it's, dude, there's – yeah, I could – you you go get your number or something. I could give you a bunch of fucking spots because there's there's yeah. too many. There's yeah, four. I can give you like exact. I'm gonna be in these areas, and you know, like all those recommendations are like exactly what I was hoping for, and not like yeah, here's this like juice place that you know. No, I know. Have, I yeah. All that. yeah, there's enough. <laughs> I mean, there's enough of that so you can find on yourself. We all know, like those. The, yeah. Totally, yeah, it, you'll see them everywhere. But like those, it's most of the places that you walk by, and you're like place looks gross and it's not and it's not right. and it's actually that's cool. why that's why i'm a firm believer to ask the locals on those kind of things because on the outside it could be like what the fuck but then on the inside yeah. it could have like the most insane you know if you're up here in canada it's like it could be the most insane poutine ever so right 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 no mm -hmm. totally totally like i like my, my version of poutine would be like you know like it's there's there was like the place across from underworld or whatever to me was like i'm like this is the best poutine on the planet and most canadians are probably like <laughs> no, <you're insane." laughs> yeah dude i mean even like i'm sure you don't even have good mexican food and I'm, I'm probably in montreal but i don't know where you're based out of but there's there's like such good mexican food here there's a place in Hollywood. oh yeah like i i I want to eat only tacos like one day that I'm there. Like, oh, yeah. I caught you covered on some taco spots. There's a real cool Mexican restaurant that's like a trip. They have like disco balls going the whole time. It's like really dark. It's called Velvet Margarita. Mm, okay. It's, it's that place is rad. That that's place, they dope. have like old, old movies playing inside with like the sound off. It's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. 
Um, I'll, I'll, you, I'll get your I'll get your info and yes. I'll, I'll find you. Yeah. Um, you know, we've covered some food stuff. Um, you know, big coffee guy. It sounds so. Like, what's the one top of the line? Like, the world is ending, but you got to go to this coffee spot at least if if you're gonna uh, spend your last day in LA. What's what's the one? Coffee, dude. That's another. Like, there's so many spots. Um, Earth Cafe. There's like three. There's one in downtown. They have really good coffee. And that's been I've been like into that lately. But like, there's Alfred. There's a place called Alfred that's really good. Um, I would probably Alfred's probably like easy to find and the most affordable, like amazing coffee that like has like multiple locations. There's obviously like these like coffee shops that are around since like the nineties that are epic and ev- everyone fucking goes there. But um, major- like Alfred's good. Uh, I'm trying to think of another spot that's out. There's, um, there's a place called fuck. What's a uh, groundworks. Do you, do you have a groundworks out there? No. I th- they're pretty no, Okay. Maybe it might just be on like the West coast. Groundworks is really good, but they're, okay. they're more chainy. Alfred's mm-hmm. cool. They only have a cup. Alfred and like earth cafe, like really good coffee. I would, would that be like similar, like chain wise to like something like Pete's? So Alfred's would be a little bit more higher end than Pete's. Yeah. So like Phil's and Pete's, like I love Phil's. Those are like there's a Phil's out here. How do you know Phil's? Have you heard of Phil's coffee? No, I no Phil's is new. Shit. See, there's so okay. Yeah. This is, <laughs> is so many. Yeah. Phil's is so Phil's is like Phil's is like Starbucks vibe. Like there, there's a lot of there's a lot in Northern California and the Bay in San Francisco. Mm. And there's there's like three or two in LA and then there's like some in orange County, but there's, there's all, they're like, like Phil's and Alfred are my kind of like go-tos if I'm like not next to the one that's next to my house, which is gotcha. just a tiny shop. Cause yeah. there, it's like they're kind of everywhere. And especially Phil's there's like a couple, um, but Alfred's like above Phil's. And then there's like these like really fancy coffee shops that are like, peppered everywhere that are like have been there for like 20 years mm. but um i would say alfred's is like a step up of starbucks step up of most most coffee it's pretty darn good and the, yeah. the locations are all like really cool i feel like when we're gonna exchange digits after this it's just gonna be like my phone's gonna be blowing up with all these google tags which i'm oh, i'm yeah. for I'm, I'm, I'm excited now i'm thinking of like there's like blue bottle too, which now, <laughs> now that I'm actually thinking about it, like blue bottles might be better than most of these spots. So I'm going to have to get your number and break okay. it down. Yeah. Yeah. We, we yeah. will most definitely. Um, maybe one of the final questions I can have that kind of centers around this whole LA discussion. If, if Michael Barr was, was mayor, what would be the one major change that you'd be making uh, in Los Angeles? You know, you grow, you grew up there. You know, you, you've lived there your whole life. You've seen it change. But if you had the power in line to, to make your own set of changes, what, what would be the one thing that you would campaign on? Sorry, my computer is going to die. One <laughs> no, that's all good. I made it through the whole thing. Um, uh, I, I don't, uh, don't you, you, you're not allowed to drive a charger and listen to bad music. In your car, the drive, drive a, a Dodge Charger. Oh, it, <laughs> I thought you were shitting on electric cars for a, for a second, but uh, no, 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 yeah, no, no, brother, it's all it's all fucking it's all fucking oil and gas. Uh, I do love trucks though, but yeah, man, there's just I don't know that that's very like insensitive and mean to me, but there is a high percentage of guys. People driving these like Dodge Chargers and Challengers around, like there's so many, and they're mm. just pumping like the worst music out, and they're all driving. <laughs> they're either wrecked, like you drive by one and they're just, they're wrecked, and there's like all these people with like chains and side bags out staring at it, going like, "Fuck!" Or they fly past you, and you're just like, "What the fuck was that car?" Like I love, dude. I know like Dodge Hell Hellcats. Like I know the whole deal. I know about horsepower and all that shit. But 
that's what I would change. I'm, I'm an old man sitting in traffic and there's just too much happening around me. If I was a right. mayor, I'd be like, all right, all these fast guys out here playing the loud rap music. There's no more. There's no more of that in this city. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like you either got to close your windows and have it at a certain volume, yeah, or yeah. Uh, you're getting a mad ticket. Yeah, um, I'm, just, I'm totally joking, but it is that moment <laughs> of like, like what is what is happening in this world? <laughs> and I'm like, not, only, not in my city. <laughs> yeah, like like old man on the line, but I'm like only 32 years old, which is like <laughs> too, too too early for me. It's have. Has it ever happened, and it, whether it's in a car or like, you know, you walked into a record store um, where you heard your band being played in, in an unexpected scenario like that? No, no. It's <laughs> only, it only happens. It only happens. Like the literal only scenario is you're on tour and like someone's like, dude, I know someone that like, works at this burger spot and we'll give you free food. And then you go to the burger spot and it's some insane kid that is like, knows everything about you. And they're playing your song when you walk in, which is like, mm. can be cool, but also like super weird. It's, like, <laughs> it's never, no, dude, I've never been like, if, if I'm going to have a theme song that I'm going to walk into the burger spot, I don't want it to be my own band's music respectfully. Dude, yeah, well, that's why like, I'm making that joke because it's like, no, dude, like for volumes, no, we have never like been somewhere. I've heard people, this is cool. I've heard people, and in LA, this is cool. I've heard people playing volumes like in their cars, driving down the street. Mm. That's a trip. That's happened yeah. like two times, but that was cool. That those are that I'm like, all right, that was yeah. that's pretty rad. So like, you was, so you have heard it where someone was playing it in their car and you were just like on the street yeah. or, or something. Yeah. Totally like yeah. I mean, I was in the valley, which is like where we're from. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like not like I'm in Hollywood or the, but I'm like definitely like in our neighborhood where we're from, but that's I'm like that's cool. Like to yeah. me. Like I'm this was like recent. I'm like old now. Like I don't think anyone was still listening to fucking wormholes, like let alone in their car. Um, <laughs> Well, like, so, what was that interaction like? Where you're like, yo, like, that's my band. Or <laughs> I think it's weird when people, like, like if any, like, I don't even tell people, I literally, the Instagram that I posted, for that reason, I literally just, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm like in the music industry, or I'm like, yeah, I'm like in the touring, and like, I, I'm working the live music industry, live touring industry. I like saying that than saying like i'm in a band because i just i just feel like for that reason like there's so many guys like me they're like i make music and yeah yeah trying to do the thing, hence you know? the tiktok that you shared on on the yeah, Instagram. dude i'm like <laughs> i don't even want to have this conversation like you, like the people at my coffee shop like they have no idea what i like they're always like what do you do and i'm just like like you're always here like what do you do and i'm like oh i'm just like i would like in entertainment because i you know i just that's all i've always been like that though I'm right weird. but i should be more like i should be like i'm in a fucking band like i work really hard you know i'm like yeah no. so yeah yeah was, sometimes I, sometimes it's like it's just you know i think it it varies on who you're speaking with because you know like there's going to be like one to like 17 follow-up questions so you're like how can i navigate this to just being super chill conversation versus like this like boomer person being like well what does that mean like some like you know also imagine like like if you're the kid playing the song and you're just like what like i don't know and, and like guarantee you like it's an old whatever i don't know it's, i think he was playing wormholes and it's like he's listening to it and then i'm standing there and then i'm like hey dude that's me and he's like would be like what the fuck are the odds of this and like what are you doing like you know i, I yeah like, it's not that crucial to me. I'm like, hell yeah. I'm a, that's, that's sick. That like, was a I'm, special moment for you. And, yeah. you know, if if that dude, you're like, you know, was even listens to this point of the podcast and was like, hey, that might have, I thought right. I saw Michael that day, but, you there know, you it, it was for, for, way, more for way you. Way cooler. Like, that's way, way cooler. cooler. And, uh, yeah, him even, like, to me, it's like, oh, he has no idea I'm standing right here. Like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I trip on that stuff. Like, I don't have, no one has to know. No one has to yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's, no. that's my um, motto. Like, no, that's no, no, that's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I think 
almost trying to approach it a little bit more as like this is stuff that I could like tell on a podcast versus right. like I need to make this a huge thing is like you know there's yeah, something to be yeah. said there for sure totally, totally. yeah well Michael this has been a great chat uh, I got one final question before I let you go we end every podcast episode with a favorite mosh story that our guests would like to share and that is like anything that is first your head that could be something that's like super bloody and gory and violent or something that's just like super funny or wholesome uh that's how we start to end the episode here so whatever's first to the dome is uh how we start to wrap up yeah i mean this is pretty easy for me uh i was dating this girl we were going to see a case of strain play at the palladium in like 2007 with like fuck, who were they playing with i forget what there was a big big tour um because like the palladium's huge case strain like i love that band but that's like a big big room right for a band like that like 2000 3000 cap so i went because i've only seen them in small venues and it was fucking crazy. And I was, I was dating this girl who was like a basket case chick. Like I had no business dating this person. And I was like very protective of her for like whatever reason. <laughs> and I like standing at the pit or whatever. And this was when I like, I was probably like really into hardcore dancing. And I thought I was like really good at it. And this kid like got like, didn't even like, I think he like brushed against me or her or something. And then I, was like yeah like, like fuck this kid and it was all hyped up walk in the middle of like a case of strange set and i like walked up and i threw the weakest punch at this kid like for what he did or whatever and i totally like missed or i think i just like barely hit him and he laid me the fuck out like <laughs> laid me out i fell backwards it was totally like disoriented and this is like when the band was like coming up too. We weren't huge, but like definitely a couple people probably listened to us in the crowd. So I was like, totally should have not done this. And I was just yeah. like fully like my teeth were bleeding. Like it was all, it was all bad to me. Mm. That that always sticks in my mind. Like, like even to this day, I'm like, you don't, you've, you've done this and you know how it ends. Like you're not going right. to like like i'm fine i can hold my own I'm like let's go but at the same time i'm like dude these kids are so hyped up doing karate kicks and shit like just, just yeah. keep it moving like yeah. there's i i love the visual of you just like throwing the first punch but it, it almost having like a boing effect when you oh, like yeah. connected with him <laughs> i probably was like you know i probably like smoked in my car outside like with my girlfriend or whoever i was driving with and like went in was all fucking like I still smoke weed and shit, but I'm like all stone, like having beers, drinking it, and like who's like, what? And just like through this slow motion punch, and this kid <laughs> literally, I just remember him being like, oh, and then just like right in my face, and then waking up to like my girlfriend like pulling me out. I had yeah, I had a couple of those moments in my life. Not proud of them, you know. You gotta keep. You gotta. You, gotta, you can't do that stuff, kids. Yeah. A, a good learning right. lesson, oh. if anything. Everybody, you can't do that stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's just not just go out because someone brushed up uh, on, on you or your girl or, or anything. Um, yeah. Michael, yeah. this has been a great chat, bro. Um, all of your links and the band's links will be in the show notes or the description. But if there's anyone you want to shout out, anything you want to plug, or anything you want to send the people off with. Um, I'll just, we're, we're doing some cool stuff right now. We're in the studio. Um, we have some time to like write some singles and, and we're actually like working on two projects in particular. One is a cover and the other one is a rendition of a song that we put out on happier that will be out before April. Oh, um, okay. So there's just like fun little creative things to keep us creative and we just wanted to do it so we're doing a cover and a rendition and it's kind of the only thing i'll plug right now and that'll be out in you know a matter of weeks and yeah yeah, we, yeah that's amazing i'm i'm looking forward to hearing what the cover is and and the new rendition um michael it's been great chatting with you and you know maybe uh this this la trip that i have coming up is pretty jam-packed but i'm gonna send you my phone number right now on instagram 
Absolutely. And uh, yeah. yeah, maybe uh, there's there's some time in the future where we link up and we're eating tacos or, or something. I would Dude, love that. Hit me up when you're in town, man. I'm your guy. <laughs> Just tell me what, how, how, you know, fucking how high, how hard you want to go, <laughs> dude. I'm, I'm, let's, let, oh. You got my number. All right. Sounds great. <laughs>